everyone. My name is Hannah Bother, and I am the short film program director for Tallgrass Film Festival. Uh, today we have our Let's Get Weird short film program Q&A. Um, we've got some great filmmakers here, so I'm going to go ahead and let them introduce themselves. We'll start with you, Manuel. Hello, everyone. I'm very excited to be here. Hannah, Tony, Jeremy, it's a pleasure to be sharing this conversation with you. Uh, my name is Manuel Del Valle. I am the director for El Triste. Uh, <laughs> All right, Tony. Uh, hi, I'm uh, Tony Hippel, the director of Standing Woman. Uh, uh, as Manuel said, it's a real pleasure to be here today. And Jeremy. Um, I'm Jeremy. I'm the writer, director, producer, editor of Everything I Learned Came From the Television and Likewise. <laughs> All right, well, um, my very first question off the bat, uh, because it's just, it's always very fascinating, especially when we get into some like stranger um, topics and uh, you know, those, the cool um, out of the box ideas. Uh, where did the idea for your film come from? Where was that inspiration? What was the source material? Um, we will start with you, Manuel, for El Triste. Um, so for me, even though the, the execution and the conception of, of the visuals are very unique and, 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 and out there, uh, I really believe that the story is like vastly universal. It's a story about self-esteem in the entertainment industry. It's a story about not feeling good enough, which I am pretty sure we all can relate uh, to, especially in the, in the creative world where ideas are everything and we connect ourselves to our ideas. Therefore, if our ideas not, are not conceived as good, we might think sometimes that our, we are not good, you know? Uh, so it, it all truly came from, the, from wanting to like touch upon this conversation. Uh, but I remember that I wanted to, to, to explore a new medium uh, to, as a director, have this concept of, of working on, on a medium that I do not understand and I'm not good at, <laughs> that, I, that, I, that, that I, I'm not an expert at. Uh, therefore, I, I saw this documentary about these amazing puppeteers in California, and I've always admired the stop motion. I've always admired puppeteering, uh, animation itself. I'm a live action director, so... Uh, I was kind of like scared into stepping into that arena, but then I was like, okay, so I want to explore puppeteering, but I do not want to, I, I want to explore the, 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 the backs, the hidden sides of puppeteering, which are, which are the puppeteers where we usually see um, the puppets and the puppeteers are in, in some great shows are greatly hidden, you know, but in this specific film, I wanted to combine those two worlds and be able to see the puppeteers, even though we are in a, in a puppet um, narrative. And that I feel like that gave it, it its own world building type of uh, process because we wanted to find the balance be between what, what, how much was gonna be, uh, how much could the, human world bleed into the puppeteer and into the puppets world. And that was something that was, it kept us very nervous, <laughs> kept us up at night. We were like, how are we gonna balance those elements out? Um, I had the great pleasure to collaborate with uh, Matt Scott, Cain Carias, Alex Riffin, some of the great puppeteers in California. And, and it just came to me. I'm, I'm very excited about the film. Incredible. Tony, uh, Standing Woman, such a unique concept. I don't think I've seen anything like it, coming close to it, touching it ever. Where did that come from? Um, th thank you, firstly. Um, I think it's a good fit for it, uh, being in the Let's Get Weird slot. So uh, thank, thank you for selecting us for that. Um, the project actually came to me through um, a writer friend, Max. Um, she was working on a PhD um, and was writing a script as part of a, just a kind of a personal exercise, but it was based off a short story she discovered by a Japanese author named Yasutaka Sutsui. Um, his work's been um, adapted into some really well-known anime, like uh, Paprika or The Girl Who Leapt Through Time. And um, she shared it with me just, um, just for general fun, and we, we often share work with one another. But um, uh, as you say, I was immediately kind of really just transported by that um, world. It was such, a, such an interesting idea, this idea of a authoritarian government essentially weaponizing uh, the fight against climate change against the people, basically kind of just turning it on them. And um, it had so many just really fascinating elements of potential to it, uh, not just in terms of kind of the inherent drama of it, but just also the just how on earth we were going to try and realize that. Um, so we 
decided to take a chance in terms of trying to get the the rights um I think you have a bit more of a chance it feels like when you're trying to adapt or get the rights to a short story for a short film there's kind of like less skin in the game it feels like and I think it'd be a very different conversation if you were trying to get it adapted into a feature um so we reached out to um to the author and um that, that was the entire process in itself is very different trying to get the rights to a, a Japanese property and we had to get it um, translated very, very specifically and he had um, approval on the final draft, but we were able to bring our own ideas to it, which is really great. Um, and at the same time, I had um, some members of kind of my regular production team um, who, who got on to do some really wonderful stuff. They worked on things like Peaky Blinders or Sensor and then uh, Doctor Who and um, it was a great opportunity to kind of bring them back. So I had my, my DOP Yenny, um, a phenomenal production designer, uh, Beth, and, and um, a new person I hadn't worked with before was um, Rachel, who was um, who was in the makeup um, side of things. And so we, we collaborated over the course of about two years, just in terms of starting to develop the, the look of the film, how we're going to um, get it across, because it's such a specific kind of dystopia. We, we've seen different kinds of dystopia before, but we were really interested in doing one which um, felt a bit closer to home but still alien a little bit otherworldly so we decided to go away from cityscapes and, and urban areas and try to talk something a bit more sleepy and rural which we felt kind of felt a little bit more insidious and um, typically you know it's dystopia tends to be a bit more um or feel a little bit more industrialized and we felt if this thing had crept all the way into the villages it would feel like it had gotten much deeper into society that way so um yeah was, that was a really fascinating part of the journey in terms of getting the rights and developing the, you know, the look of the tree people, which required a lot of the careful mixing between um, makeup work and, um, and really elaborate tree builds as well. So, yeah, just yeah, really enjoyable thing to do. And I, and I love creature effects. I love um, uh, practical effects and things like that. So it's just a wonderful opportunity to kind of bring a lot of those things together. Um, but yeah, again, with a really fascinating um, thematic idea. Absolutely. And Jeremy, same question to you. Um, I guess this is a fun follow up with what uh, Tommy just said, because I, the germination for, for everything I learned in the, the title comes from a song that we actually got the rights for from the band, but I was just listening to the song. It is the opening lyric for, for, uh, for that song. And I went, you know what, cool. Kind of started thinking there. And then going down the road of like this dystopian future. And for me, it went instead of it crawling, as Tony said, kind of crawling all the way into like rural, rural areas, I went, what happens when it's the start of the dystopian future, but someone stops it immediately? And like kind of getting into this thing of, of unsung heroes, because I've always seen the dystopian future where it's like, it's fully dystopia, it's already happened, someone has to like break the cycle. And so I, I was so fascinated with the idea of what happens if someone stops it before it gets started? And so between the the song kind of coming there, I went, what if this, whatever power is, is causing this dystopian future or will cause it kind of gets shut off right at the source. And that's where uh, this whole thing came from and keeping it, you know, then it stays way smaller scale. There's so much more, I think of like a power struggle and a power dynamic. And through that, I think there's a lot more of like a universal I, I think there's a there's a, a fun way to play with a lot of universal messaging in that about like your own kind of like hero's journey and what you think you can do and like where do you say okay this has gone far enough and what can I do to stop whatever I see happening in front of me. Absolutely. <clears throat> a little bit of a curveball question maybe but for Tony and Jeremy I feel like I I in recent years I've seen a uh, my fair share of like the dystopian future um, stories. Um, <laughs> and, you know, what's awesome is that every filmmaker comes at it from their own perspective. And it's, you know, I swear it's like unique every time and you've got these new interesting ways to look at it, like both of your films. Um, but where do you think that's coming from? I, maybe you can talk about it from personal experience, but why are we seeing so many of these dystopian future type of stories right now? Tony, do you want to start? To go? <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll start, sure. Um, I, I think on a fundamental level, I think it, it comes from a lot of just personal anxiety everyone has about the future. I think, you know, and I, I grew up as a lifelong Star Trek fan, so yeah, I, I, I want to believe in the optimistic future, but I think um, reality tells us quite likely that it's most likely not going to be unless we do something about it. So as Jeremy's saying, like we need people to kind of step in to prevent the dystopia from happening. But 
Um, at the same time, the function of good dystopia is, you know, because it's fundamentally horror. I think most dystopia is, is, is horror by its nature. I think in some regards, it works really well to kind of hopefully galvanize people into an action to avoid those futures. Now, I think some of those dystopias are, you know, um, are much less likely, but they still tend to reflect something or some sort of anxiety about something in our future, be it, you know, AI or um, you know, genetic works and things like that, about your know, biological warfare, all, all kinds of different potential things like human, you know, just also, you know, even extending to human rights, just all sorts of pretty much everything we can be afraid of in the future, I think dystopia can, can kind of play with. So it gives us a fertile ground to kind of talk about what's happening now or we, we're worried that could happen. And I think um, we're all worried about something and some of us have just have got our eye on different things. I think that's where a lot of these different dystopias can can spring from. Um, thinking about this um, um, short story that we came from, I think obviously, you know, there's concerns about um, things like gene therapy and things like that, but I don't think I was initially expecting it to be people being turned into trees for um, uh, yeah, by an authoritarian government, but I think a lot of people have a legitimate fear of authoritarianism at the moment. So I think, you know, that, that I think is, you know, the thing which very much works um, in terms of the dystopian aspect, but I think we can also still rightly have concerns about um, um, science being weaponized against people as well. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, yeah, I think to go with that, I think like, it's such a thing about like what we're anxious about. And then for us as creatives and storytellers, it's somewhat extrapolating that and going, okay, if I think about this a little further and I go down that road and keep going down that road, you get to a point where you go uh, authoritarian governments. For me, it's, I mean, it's in the title of mine, right? I think there's very much a like yeah. reliance on technology. It's, it's not subtle, I'm gonna be honest, right? Like uh, there's very clearly a, a kind of like how much we rely in, and you know, for me, for, for everything I learned, it's kind of that thing of like, if that became sentient and tried to flip our reliance on technology around on us, that's where that goes. I do think it's a little bit of just like, we all have anxieties. Like I look at my phone too much. I know that I still can't do anything about it. Uh, and so when we go down that road and you go, okay, if this went worst possible outcome to worst possible outcome, this is kind of where it would go. And then for me to kind of belay those fears or get over them, I will go and try and make the film about them, tell the story about it and go, but I can tell the story where someone's going to stop it in the first place. Right. And kind yeah. of use the beanie, the medium that we, that we work in and that what we love to do and, and kind of process everything that like I think about through that and hope that it resonates with anyone who watches it. Absolutely. Okay. Pivoting back to, um, <laughs> back to the present day. Um, <laughs> so Manuel, I want to know with El Triste, was it a chicken and the egg situation? Which came first, the puppets or the characters? Did you did you write these characters and then did you find the perfect puppets or marionettes for them? Or did you uh, find these marionettes and then write around them? It was a little bit of both. Okay. Uh, we had a, uh, I had a, uh, a good understanding of the type of characters that I needed mm -hmm. for this story. One thing that was clear from the very beginning is that this film touches on, on diversity in the entertainment industry and, and not feeling like we belong there. And so that naturally spoke to the need to find very unique individuals. Mm -hmm. uh, therefore the whole puppet uh, world, you know? Um, I remember when I, well, uh, the main character is based on, on El Triste, which is a Latino uh, puppet that is kind of popular on social media between, in between the Latino communities. Absolutely crazy. People tattoo him. People get, get tattoos of El Triste. It's absolutely crazy. <laughs> uh, and I was, I was so intrigued by this because I just find it very, pop very funny that uh, the, the, the character is called El Triste, but he has a ton of attention and I wanted, and, and that's definitely not what, what brings you joy. And I, and I completely connected with, uh, with uh, Cain when, when we're talking about the name of El Triste and how much being popular did not affect the fact that he was called El Triste. So I wanted to explore that idea. Uh, so it came from there, but when we wanted to like build the, ro the world around El Triste, uh, I found this amazing puppeteer called um, 
Matt Scott. Uh, I remember when I wrote this script with very unique individuals, I went in, into his apartment, nervous if he was wanna, gonna join the project. Um, and I remember that, that we read the script, he deeply connected with it. Um, and then I said, so I wanna cast some amazing puppets, where can I find them? And he points at the, at the roof. Uh, and I look up and he had hundreds of puppets. Oh my gosh. On the roof. It was absolutely a beautiful experience. And I, and I got the opportunity to kind of have, have a balance between adapting some of the characters to the puppets and adapting some of the puppets uh, to the script. Uh, we did a couple of changes to some of the characters' faces. Um, mm -hmm. we, created, we created three faces for El Triste because it's all about evolution, how he grows. And, um, but most of the characters were inspired by Matt, Matt Scott, a uh, extremely unique mind. It's absolutely crazy what he does. So yeah, it was kind of like a, it was kind of like piggyback, like going back and forth between the script, the characters, and right. just finding the right balance. Incredible. Um, Tony, I want to go to you next. You touched on this a little bit, but I'm really curious about um, the, uh, the special effects involved in your film. You've got all of these different levels of um, transformation, I guess you could call it. Um, and, you know, in those, the early stages, like when you're talking about more of the makeup, how long did all of that take? And were you saying that the trees themselves, like when we're talking about the, um, the end, her, how she ends up, it, was that practical? Yeah, so um, we ended up with absolutely everything being in camera and practical, which was really great. I, I love practical effects, but obviously there's um, definite places where CG has a, a really great purpose and quite often as well um, enhancing um, a lot of practical effects. And we did consider having some um, some digital um, extensions. So we, we were thinking at times about potentially just extending some of the um, the builds out beyond what we build practically. Um, but in, in the end, we just felt it, it, we knew how to do it practically. We could, could do it all in camera, and that obviously makes things much easier for us in post. Um, we did discuss um, having some CG enhancements on the dog bush, and I kind of wish we had done because uh, we were considering doing um, uh, having its nose a little bit animated or, or get the eyes and um, have a little bit of life. But um, it's, just, it's just one of those things that kinda, you have to kind of sacrifice something somewhere just in terms of um, just, just the budget, the workflow, the cost, just getting it all. Um, through to the end so I, I kind of wish we'd, we'd gotten there with that but uh, for everything else I think um, it works really really um, well in camera and a lot of it is smoke and mirrors which I really love as well about um, practical mirror, uh, practical effects work um, but we did spend a, a huge amount of time developing at the same time we um, um, wanted to make sure that they all had a certain individuality to them because fundamentally they're all individual people so when we you see these different postman trees they have a different look to it and then um, particularly at the end for the titular standing woman of Marie she has a very different look and we wanted to make sure that um, that was very discernible in the actual tree design. So each character actually has a di is a different genus of tree. So we have, like, I believe the postman is an oak tree and Marie's turning into a cherry blossom tree. And so the makeup of the, um, of the makeup, of the, of the makeup of the bark has a very specific look yeah. to it. And um, we wanted to land in a place where it felt um, real and believable and just unnerving enough to break the, this idea of kind of this very easy romantic notion it can have i think you know we've often seen kind of imagery of people being absorbed into nature and stuff and it seems like it's quite peaceful and nice and that's exactly what um the government is pushing in this film um, in terms of like on to, in terms of the propaganda end of things and the whole idea is when you get closer you can see um the kind of physical devastation that it's wreaking and you know there's there's blood beneath the bark essentially and then that kind of ties into kind of the body horror element which i, I, I enjoy good body horror as well um but there's, you know, trying to find little rooms to um, give it some personality as well, or a, a little bit of an um, oddness to it. So I was really obsessed with having Marie to have a single, like, antler-like branch growing out of her forehead. That is, it's a little bit alien, but it's very um, eye-catching, I think, at the same time. But um, it, it did take a great deal of time because we had to, it's about, it about two years of working on the script and getting the rights and getting that approved. And then after that, it was probably a year and a half, two years in terms of, developing the look of the trees because it was a case of making sure everyone was free from the from the key departments and then researching it prepping it and building it with a, a limited budget we had to self-fund in the end because it's quite tricky to get funding for genre work in the UK it's, it's we were seeing some positive move again it's still quite tricky so we had to account for what money we had and we so we had to 
split the shoot up. So we had to do a lot of reuses. So there's a tree next to the postman at one point and we reuse that tree for later on in the film and we basically needed the time to slightly refabricate it. Um, so there's you know, a, a lot of good trickery in there. Um, again, for example, when the people actually sit, sat in the ground or sat in, into the tree logs, we just have them stepping behind the front kind of um, false front and to kind of hide um, the join. So yeah, very pleased to get it all in practical, but yeah, a lot of you know cheeky tricks to get there. Absolutely. Um, Jeremy, you had some effects in your film as well, especially the like cloudy eyes. They're so strange and weird. Were, were, the, were you working with more practical effects or um, more um, uh, in you know, post effects? And um, how did you decide on the vibe slash look of your dystopian future? Um, so I wanted to do practical effects for that. Mm -hmm but they're like, you can get like cloud contacts and everything. They are mainly illegal now, unless they're like prescribed oh. by an optician. And we didn't have the budget to send all of our cast to opticians to get like different levels of uh, like clouded. Basically the idea was to have it mirror the TV static was kind of the idea there. And so me and my DP, when we were talking about it, we were like, you know what, this is, as much as we love to do practicals, I love working with practicals. Uh, that was one of those where we went just for time, for budget, for the sake of getting this project done, uh, we have to do in post. And luckily I know someone who's very good at doing that kind of thing. And we pitched him the idea and he said, great, cool, let's let's do it. And so that, that was, uh, I mean, disappointing, right? Because I would would have loved to have it practical. I love the way practicals look in camera, but you know, just for sake of the the kind of what we do and and you know, getting things done and working on the budgets we work on, it was just easier to do it in post. Um, so that was all of our our effects are done in post there. Um, and then kind of the look again was going for this like not quite all powerful thing yet this thing that's like still kind of growing in power and kind of deciding mm -hmm. well it wouldn't have if it doesn't have power it probably doesn't have access to funds and money and so what does that look like of something that's mm -hmm. just like has these right like for for us the tvs and the that kind of like ai has these dreams and, and again if she doesn't stop them in a couple years it's probably in this giant kind of like blade runnery big cavernous uh a uh, room but for now it's okay. in like a little black room right it's just kind of in we we went for the, the thought of like what if it was just in someone's basement like what if the start of the dystopian future just started in some random basement in the like suburbs steve jobs in the uh in a garage yeah, garage, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> right right and like instead of creating apple it takes over the world yeah. <laughs> uh you know which debatable on on how that goes um but like, that was kind of the idea for the look for us was like everything kind of like sleek, but sleepy mm -hmm. and kind of super as low key as you could make it while still having the kind of sense of impending doom that if this, if this specific action that this, that our lead girl takes doesn't work out, mm. it's going to go poorly for the rest of the world. Absolutely. <laughs> Hi, Jessica. Welcome. Um, if you want to go ahead and introduce yourself, tell us um, what your film is or the name of your film, your role in the film. And then um, uh, I'm going to go ahead and ask you the question now uh, that I've asked everyone. Um, what was your inspiration for creating this film? What was your source material? Um, why did you make this film essentially? Awesome. Hi, everyone. Sorry, I'm late at uh, work. Um, <laughs> I'm on a series at the moment. Um, so I'm Jessica Sharif. I am the director and one of the producers of In Hollywood Land. So In Hollywood Land is the story of Zadwa, who's an actress, um, you know, struggling actress who all of a sudden gets her big break, but her big break uh, makes her go down the rabbit hole of Hollywood Land, which um, is a cross between our industry and Alice in Wonderland, basically, um, Wonderland. And so the inspiration actually was a friend of mine, Yatide Badaki, who's the writer and, and the star, and also one of the producers of this. Um, 
she wrote that she was in between at the time she was on American Gods and it was in between season one and two and she you know she wanted to start writing and um, um, her and Karen couldn't be here today because they're both um, shooting as well um, and so she's the one who kind of thought up my goodness the similarities are a little scary in terms of both worlds especially for people who are othered right especially for women women of color um, people of color uh, anyone of the LGBTQ community. And so she had this idea and came up with this idea. And we, we you know, talked about it and she developed the script and then brought on Karen David as our third producer who also plays um, Queenie. And then, yeah, and then so that that's that's the inception of the film. And in terms of what attracted me to it, I think I just really, really related to to the metaphor um, that Yatide discovered and this idea of, you know, I'm always, I mean, even here, right, in terms of when you're talking about the filmmakers, uh, the only woman in the room, the only Arab woman in the room. Um, and so it's, it's something that's very dear and close to my heart. And in terms of just what she has to go through, um, I thought Yatide did such a good job of finding you know transforming these characters you have the the evil queen who all of a sudden is this casting director you have the mad hatter who's the director and you know my personal favorite plays by dominic burgess who's just one of the most incredible actors ever and is in everything um and uh you know having this caterpillar become this harvey weinstein type character and it just really, really resonated on so many levels. And she actually came up with this idea before me too, which is insane, um, which is very funny. And so as we started, you know, talking about it and developing it and, and we, we really went out of our way to make sure that not just the people on screen, but behind the scenes represented the world as we know it in terms of gender, in terms of ethnicity, in terms of uh, sexual orientation and disability and, and so forth and so forth. So it was really, you know, it was a, a a project of love that we did on the side and we're really proud of and it was it was fun absolutely um you touch on your cast just a little bit other than your incredible producers um it, i mean well including them of course but you have a, a, an incredible cast um but other than your producers how did you find the rest of your cast uh we jen Sh uh, jess sherman sorry our our casting director is incredible she's um, you know, she did, um, I'm now blanking on all her credits and she's gonna murder me, but uh, she did uh, the, oh my God, the one with the, the psycho one where it's the psycho prequel. Oh, the um, Bates, Bates Motel. Motel. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> I'm trying to think of it. And then my mind just went completely blank. It was lovely. Um, so she was wonderful and, and, you know, really has such an eye for talent. And then it, it really became, you know, also, people that we knew in the same way and so it, it kind of became an amalgam of everything and then and we got our first choices for everyone which is wow. wonderful um and there yeah I mean all of them you know um it's Jen Richards Luke Youngblood they're all they're all incredible actors so yeah. and it was fun because a lot of them also don't uh, Yatide and and uh Dominic have done a lot of fantasy and, and the TV shows that they do, but you know, Jen does not at all this kind of stuff. Luke, I mean, he did Harry Potter, but after that, you know, everything that he does is not not fantastical like this. Yeah. So it was fun to to get to play on this blank canvas. I think for me as a director, that was the biggest thing of finding a cinematographer that was as, you know, nuts as me in terms of what can we do with this crazy budget? And just <laughs> whether, you know, you filmmakers also can relate to of like, this is all we have. All right, and then you just set completely unrealistic goals, and then the rest of the process is just figuring out how to make it happen. So the last scene is actually we shot in a miniature, and then we shot her on green oh. screen, which is just a green background. <laughs> um, and and then you know put her in. So I think it was it became that of because because it doesn't happen in our worlds, and and the movie doesn't have any of our constraints, right? We we don't have to live within a specific set of rules. We just made our own, so that really freed us up in terms of visually um so let's, let's go all out yeah i kind of touched on this with um with jeremy and tony but mm -hmm. for manuel and for jessica you both kind of transport us to this other world and while yours is you know definitely like still in the real world i mean i grew up a theater kid so i totally know that like that backstage like vibes but it it still just feels um it feels like you're totally being transported there through, you know, colors and 
um, just the, the vibes of your film. Um, and then Jessica, of course, you've got this whole fantasy world and each little um, vignette that you end up in has a different feeling, has a different look. Um, can you talk about, and we'll start with um, you, Manuel, talk about finding that look for your film and, and you know, finding that vibe? Definitely. Uh, for us, well, I, I tend to try to, to I, I'm, I'm a big admirer of, of subtle world building and like mm -hmm. fantasy that is kind of like leaning more towards reality, but there's an element of fantasy there. Um, and for me, it was kind of imperative to not go too much out of the way of a, of a, a palpable world, you know? Mm -hmm. Uh, we really relied on the uniqueness of the marionettes and we really relied on the production designer, Christian Quintanilla, who is amazing. Uh, but uh, Olivia Gastaldo, uh, they is an amazing um, director of photography. And we found together uh, this balance between uh, estalizing the cinematography and making, making it tilt loose, tilt uh, warms and colds, but making sure that it was desaturated enough that it, that it doesn't feel like we're going stepping out too much outside of the real world. Um, we really made a, a, one of the biggest scares or biggest concerns cinematography wise was the, the fit of the puppeteers. How is that going to be distracting for the, for, for the audience, you know? Because we're so used to seeing the, the Muppets, you know, and the puppeteers are behind the curtain. But for this piece specifically, we were um, very, very concerned about how that was going to affect, you know, and if that was going to be distracting. So the costume designers really, really helped us out to make sure that the fit were there, but they were not distracting. Um, and and that I feel like that's what gives a lot of uniqueness to this short film because we've seen many puppet films, but we rarely see a puppet film that is happening within the puppets. But there's a backstory with the humans happening at the same time, parallel. You know. Yeah. Uh, so that's I, I feel like balancing those elements out was was that was very very concerning uh, and 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 we were worried a lot about it. But I feel like we, we managed to find a balance there, so. Absolutely. And same question to you, Jessica. By the way, Hannah, I love, this is my favorite part of, of festivals, of hearing other filmmakers and their process. And yeah. like, it, it's, it's, yeah, so thank you for, for hosting this and, and making this happen. Um, um, I love that question. So similarly to what Manuel was saying, um, we, we knew that we're kind of diving into the rabbit hole. So early on the conversation was, we don't want it to feel crazy fantastical at the beginning, mm -hmm. right? We want it to feel, it is, it's a, it was a black box theater and she's there and something that, that still seems normal. Oh, sorry, first she meets the agent, which is completely like a real location, then a little more fantastical. And as the story progressed, these vignettes, if you will, progress and she keeps diving into the world, then we wanted all the rules of reality to, to completely leave until the very end where it's just, you know, this cloud um, madness. And so um, same thing that Manuel just said, I think for me, it's always, I think the best um, directors ally themselves with the most talented people they can find. And so that was the case. I mean, our production designers, um, Rachel Lee Pandero and um, Tammy Trin, who just again, with the short budget, we're, we're like, all right, this is a blank canvas. What are we doing? What do you want? And a lot of it we built in one location. So we had this big cycle and just went crazy and nuts on it and with colors and, and with lighting and, and really working with the cinematographer and the production designers of, hey, how can we utilize this space and then start adding the fantastical elements? But same thing that Manuel was saying is keeping this groundedness, right? Where, where's the grounded part for us? And um, similarly, the costumes were a very, very big thing. Um, they all, you know, each had one costume, but we wanted it to feel, um, not feel like they're playing dress up, not feel like they're at Comic-Con. And our uh, Jacqueline Garvey's our costume designer. She just, she was just nominated. We're at um, Film Quest. She was nominated for best costume. Which oh, is, awesome. Give her a shout out. Um, and I think it's finding those elements of, of reality um, within the fantastical was, was a huge conversation as well. But yeah, for us, it was really feeling like you're diving into the crazy visually, mm -hmm. not just 
dropped in from the very beginning so that yeah. we're disorienting everyone the same way that the main character is but through the production design um and and the yeah and the and the camera movement for us as well a lot incredible well um i'm gonna ask my last question here which is a bummer because this has been a fantastic discussion um around these um amazing films um anything else you guys want to add to to this um anything you guys forgot to mention but just wanted to know what you're all up to next, um, what you've got in the works, what you want to point people towards, if you've got um, something to plug, anything like that, or a place where people can find out what you're going to do next when you announce it. <laughs> so we'll start with you, Manuel. Um, I, am, I am a director, but also a producer. I'm co co currently in development as a producer for three short films. Um, uh, some of them are in post-production, some of them are in pre-production, but I'm also in the development of my feature film, which is, uh, I would call it a similar genre to this film. It's magical realism in a way. It's a, it's a bedtime uh, story crafted for adults. It's a cautionary tale. Um, I'm very excited about that. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm putting a... a a music video in, in the festival run, which is very exciting. It's a black and white four by four a fantasy. Um, and yeah, no, uh, I mean, you can find me on Instagram as Manuel DBMA, as the DBMA, yes, Manuel DBMA, <laughs> Del Valle Martin Alba. Uh, and um, you can see my work there. I'm easy to reach. Uh, please reach out. Absolutely. And to you, Tony? Uh, yes, thank you for having us, by the way. Um, yeah, this, this is the sad part, but uh, saying goodbye to everyone. But um, yeah, uh, in terms of stuff I'm working at the moment, uh, very similar to what Mama was saying, um, I'm working on a number of different shorts at the moment, just polishing a few things off. Um, I've got a feature that's running concurrently in festivals at the moment as well. That's um, complete tonal opposite to Standing Woman. Um, that's, uh, I've been told Standing Woman is incredibly bleak and uh, my feature is a, is a absurdist comedy it's kind of a, a, a post-apocalyptic mockumentary like it's absolutely absurd so it kind of a good palate cleanse if you want something completely different and um, that should hopefully be seeing some distribution um, early next year um, but uh, again I'm also working on um, a number of projects I'd like to follow up with at the moment so um, developing a few features at, at the moment um, we'd love to adapt standing one into a feature if we could but that's a good that'll be a different conversation we'll need to um, reach out to the author again and see what we can do in terms of um, adjusting the rights there because I, th I think there's such a wonderful amount of ground to cover in terms of um, how that world could affect various people across different areas of society um, and, and just kind of looking at how people react um, to that kind of world um, and I think there's again a lot of possibilities in terms of how we could go further with the designs and the, and the practical effects works so I think that could be really exciting. Oh and uh, if anyone wants to find me I'm on, on Instagram at hip since 1980. Perfect. <laughs> um, and Jeremy, to you. Um, I've got two shorts in post that are hopefully done this week. Uh, so those hopefully doing festivals next for the next year's circuit, we're going to start submissions on uh, Friday for both of those, both of those in the like magical realism, kind of darker, fantastical, you know, genre. That is what I usually stick to. And then I've got two features uh, in development both one a little bit more in body horror kind of thing and the other one a little bit more a uh, kind of dark coming of age story but all in that again like that magical realism into thriller sci-fi however you want to describe I find it so hard to put a genre on like all of our films mm -hmm. here where people go well what is it and you go well it's a mix of this and this and this and this and you know what let's just call it let's get weird and, yeah. and yeah. stick with that. <laughs> That's um, why I love this program. It, you don't you don't got to be any specific genre to be here. <laughs> we usually yeah, call it the problem of the only child. When they ask us about similar movies, like, no, it's, it's an only child. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I like that. I also, I'm guessing it's been hard for all of us to go, like, even for some of the festival submissions where they go, how would you categorize your film? And I just go, I, I, I guess. All of the above? <laughs> right. It's like, can I pick three? And they go, yeah. no, pick one. And you go, mm, but okay cool which like again a a uh, a good problem to have I think mm -hmm. like I don't think any of us would have it any other way right like I think we make the things that are a little harder to make but can pay off if 
you do it correctly. And that's not to put down anybody else's work or anything like that. Um, and then you can find me Instagram and Twitter at Jeremy two underscores and then Stuart, S-T-E-W-A-R-T. And all of those will be, will have all the updates on all of my work. Perfect. All right, and Jessica. Um, Jeremy, I love how you just described that is literally how I describe um, I'm what's called a third culture kid and I'm I've like three passports and different ethnicities and grew up in different countries and speak five languages and the way you described is the way I described like how many people are like what are you like where are you from and I'm just like oh boy here we go All so of that was amazing I was like that's that's the first time I've heard it described that way and it's exactly it but with going with film um and what was I gonna say oh yeah me uh so yeah, I have another, a short, completely different, again, I'm also feel that same feeling in terms of what Tony was saying. I'm just, you have completely different, you know, I don't want to be just in one genre. And I know our industry really tries to, to put us in these boxes and I just spend my time trying to get out of them. Um, and so I have a short, this one's a drama. It's a completely, completely different tone. And it's kind of a meditation on grief with two um, teenagers, two teenage girls. And so that's called Thanks for Nothing. And that's coming out similarly um, to Jeremy, but we're nowhere near done. We just we just did uh, our live recording with our composer. Um, so we're still got long way, long ways to go. That'll be coming out next year. Then I have I have a documentary feature that um, will be coming out next year. That's in the last stages of post production. And then I have a series that I'm working on right now. My first series I sold to A and E, a documentary series uh, about stand up comedy. So that'll hit in May 2022. And then just still constantly creating, trying to get my first scripted feature off the ground as well. So we'll see. Incredible. Well, thank you all so much for being here today uh, for uh, talking about your films. And thank you all out there for tuning in and um, for watching Tall Grass. Thanks. And if I may, thank you, Hannah, just for seriously, Absolutely. for taking the time to do this. And without you guys, without festivals, you know, short films would not just have a platform at all. So Absolutely. It, it, it's you know, truly appreciated. It's awesome. Short films, I think might be my one true love. So <laughs> <laughs> I got to get them out there. <laughs>